Welcome, Welcome to the Moto Marketing Podcast, presented by Racer X, the podcast for moto industry professionals, entrepreneurs, and riders. If you want to grow your brand and business in today's digital first world, you have to know how to turn a stranger into a fan, turn a like into a customer. You have to know how to turn attention into dollars. This podcast is dedicated to keeping you in the know on real marketing tactics that work in the moto world so that you grow your business and help grow the sport. Get ready to learn from the very same marketing experts trusted by Racer X, Lucas Oil Pro Motocross, GNCC, and NBC Sports. They'll help you navigate the world of digital marketing for your moto brand. This is the Moto Marketing Podcast. Podcast. Presented by Racer X. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Nestle. We've got a great show lined up for you today. A great guest, somebody that I'm super interested to hear from, and I think you will be uh, as well. Before we dive into it, I want to tell you about Racer X's promotion that they have going on currently. Um, it's a really popular one, and uh, it's one I'm a fan of. If you subscribe and renew today, you're going to get a free pair of Racer X themed undies from Ethica. It's a value of $56. You get them for just 30 bucks. You also get the print, uh, 12 issues of the print magazine, and you get all of those uh, digitally if you would prefer that. Uh, there's some great features in there. Um, one that has been pretty popular is All Things In Badly. Uh, the Eli Tomac Monster Energy uh, team announced that they are going to be splitting up, uh, and they they claim that it's on good terms, but they take a look back at some of the most iconic and notorious breakups in the sports history. Really, really cool piece. You can, you can subscribe or renew using my link. It's racerxonline.com forward slash moto marketing. I don't get a kickback or anything, but it just gives me some credit which is helpful when you have guys like Weege and Steve and uh, Daniel Blair that have much bigger shows than me. So help me out. I'd appreciate it. All right. We've got an awesome guest for you today. Obviously, everybody knows I'm an avid cyclist, uh, an avid e-bike racer, e-bike team owner. So when uh, Nash, a previous guest of ours, uh, who had a very popular episode, uh, introduced me to his friend Mike Morrow from GT Bicycles, I had to hit him up, had to get him on the show. And uh, Mike, I'm excited to chat with you, man. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for having me. This is, uh, this is a great way to... Uh... To, to spend a little bit of uh, productive Zoom time. You know, we've been living in this environment for, God, what's it been, 20-something months now, it feels like. Yes. Um, and it's surprising, if I look back, how comfortable um, we've all gotten kind of just staring at our staring at our computer screens and having conversations with, from the outside, it looks like we're just talking to ourselves. But this is really cool that we could do this, man. Yeah, man. This will be fun. For sure. Yeah, so I, I'm uh... – yeah, and you I mean you've got you've got quite the personality, which makes it always fun for these. Um, and and I, I guess if you're friends with Nash, you've got to have a personality. I don't think that's yeah, allowed to something commute. wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. So, um, I, I mean, let's let's dive into your story first, and then we'll talk about GT here in a little bit. Um, how did you get to where you're at today? Are you a lifelong cyclist, or how, what led you to kind of being on the GT uh, team? All right, so this is actually a really cool story because if I look, I'm going to be 45 this year. So I look, if I look back to kind of like 12 year old Mike, um, I'm pretty much living what could possibly be a dream. I mean, of course, 12 year old Mike would want to be like uh, a professional freaking racer or freestyler for GT. But the fact that I'm actually working with the GT brand now and have been for the past 11 years is is so awesome because I grew up. Um, riding a lot of bmx i raced a bit transitioned to um a bit of freestyle my level of freestyle hugely inspired by the movie rad yep. of course um and at the same time a crew of guys that i was um, riding and then skating with a bunch actually started um dipping their toes in motocross so i got hooked on that bug and my father being the gearhead that he was um on my 12th birthday was like mike we're going racing Okay, he's a car head. He's, he's ridden motorcycles. He taught me to ride on a, a, an old Boltaco, which was all, you know, bass backwards because the shifter and the brake are on opposite sides of the bikes back then. So, of course, it, and if you talk to any of my friends that um, I used to travel with racing motocross, I explained a lot with uh, maybe my crashing from learning with everything crisscross like that. But um, right. uh, what was really cool is 
as I got more hooked in motocross, the bike riding, especially mountain biking, to kind of supplement it. And, you know, when you're younger and you can't really, you got to wait on mom and dad or, or somebody's older brother or an older buddy to bring it to the practice track, you still go ride and you know it's good for you. So I got, I actually got really into mountain biking um, at a recreational or kind of supplemental level while I was trying to, you know, enjoy the, the moto uh, adventure. And then um, my senior year of college, I went to uh, school in Florida and I, uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. I had the opportunity to be down there, race year round. Um, I had, you know, made it to local, cra terrible, crappy local pro level um, racing and, and made friends with a bunch of guys down there that had made such great careers like Ronnie Renner, um, Jason Baker from Dream Tracks. These were guys that um, yeah. Jason yeah. actually came on right when I was uh, kind of getting ready to graduate but we would ride at Jason's house. So it was really cool to connect with those guys. Um, I went to school for graphic design. I've always had a knack for art um, and then worked in like kind of the more ad agency side of things, got super hurt racing and got um, an opportunity shoot. Yeah. 11 years ago to work with cycling sports group, okay. which is the, uh, the parent company of uh, Cannondale and GT bicycles. And our parent company also owns, um, Schwinn and Mongoose brands too. So it's pretty cool. Like these iconic brands yeah. in different retail channels. It's pretty cool. I, I've learned that over the years as, as a kid, I always thought these were separate brands. And, and honestly, as a, as a business owner, and when we started to, to do a lot of work in the cycling and motorcycle space, when we started to try to approach multiple brands, we realized we're, we're really just talking to one big uh, company. So it, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting how many brands are kind of under the same or a similar roof. Do you guys guys uh, at GT do you do you work closely with your kind of sibling companies like uh like Cannondale or or do you pretty much are you completely separate have separate offices well I, nobody has an office right now I guess but do you guys completely operate separately or how does that work no it's so we have like I manage the I have a dedicated brand marketing team so I've got kind of creative I've got marketers content specialists and then we have shared resources um on like some of the engineered side of things some of the finance side of things so there's it's a mixed bag it's pretty cool because you'll have um cannondale or gt dedicated product managers but then engineers that are, are working simultaneously on on similar products so they have yeah. to understand kind of brand values and brand aesthetics and certain requirements um because they're a shared resource like industrial designers are designing you know a new product for one brand and they have to do something similar for the other brand and they have to make sure creatively and functionally that they have a unique kind of footprint. Yeah. So it's yeah. pretty cool. There's some that shared cool. resources and a, and a mixed bag of uh, brand dedicated. So you'd mentioned BMX and that's where my background is. I, I grew up being the biggest moto fan like my idols where a lot of people would idolize you know stick and ball figures like Michael Jordan or whatever my, my idols were were motocross athletes. Uh, my mom and dad would never let me race. I had a motorcycle, I was allowed to ride. So my only racing outlet, and I'm super competitive, even to this day, I love racing, but I was only ever allowed to race bicycles. And a BMX track came to my little town in, in West Virginia. Uh, and I got hooked and started racing when I was 12. And so when I was really getting into it is when BMX really first started to get introduced to the Olympics and, and guys like Randy Stumphauser and Mike Day and those those were my heroes on on a BMX bike, and I've learned I still race BMX. Um, uh, USA BMX, the sanctioning body of the entire sport, is a client of ours, and we work closely with them. And I, I've learned over the last couple of years that it's kind of like a lot of moto guys get their start in BMX, and then they get out of it and they race moto. And now I'm you're seeing a lot of it coming full circle to where their kids are getting into BMX and hopefully they stay but a lot of them will kind of leave and go into moto and then you there's i feel like mountain biking is and road cycling has always been a big aspect for a moto fan but i feel like it's even bigger maybe because of the pandemic that we just went through but how do you see kind of pedal bicycles versus motorcycles and is it do you guys go after the same do you look at it as the same customer if you got a motorcycle you're going to be interested in our product is it a little bit of both it's completely different but it's the same what how do you guys approach that from a marketing standpoint at gt so that's a really really good question and absolutely for gt in particular yes it's um we see the the moto consumer the the 
I guess the values uh, of like a, a BMX racer or someone that's an avid mountain biker or potential e-bike mm-hmm. um, purchaser is so, so similar to like the power sports audience, right? They value the fun and freedom that two wheels bring. They value a bit of competition. They value performance and they're willing to kind of to spend. They know that it's, if you think about it from an e-bike to a dirt bike, they're, they're expensive toys, right? Yeah. Um, but there's that you could, what you could do on these bikes, um, whether it is pedal assist analog, right. Um, <laughs> or, or throttle controlled, it's, um, it's all about kind of pushing limits and, and that, and that kind of that freedom of being outside. And I, 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 I really feel that they, they are the same or very similar kind of mindset. Yeah. Um, it's funny you mentioned BMX, right. It's McGrath. That's yeah. all that when he first broke out on the scene and how he, how he quickly made strides. That's all anybody talked about was his, cause he wasn't such an accomplished BMX racer. And today with Millsap's kids are super serious in racing. Yep. Um, Christian, uh, Christian Craig, um, yeah. We actually just got a Mach 1 out for the little man um, to start cutting his teeth at the BMX racetrack. So we That's are cool. seeing that. Yeah. Man, it's, it's, it is interesting. And, and I, I noticed the, the ability to do things on a motorcycle that some of my friends weren't able to just from a jumping standpoint when I was a kid. And, and what's funny is I recently in the last three, four years got into mountain biking. I mean, I grew up riding bikes my entire life, but I never got into mountain biking. E-bikes come along and now all of a sudden I'm all in it. The things that I'm able to do on an e-bike because of my BMX background, something as simple as hopping over a log that's, you know, two and a half, three feet off the ground when somebody that is quote unquote faster than me can't get over it because they don't have that background. It's, it, it is amazing the, the skill set that a bicycle in general can give yeah. you in, in transition in the other sports. Do you think that's a reason? I know there's the fitness side of it, but do you think that there there is a that might be a reason that so many moto athletes uh, turn to mountain biking and 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 use that as a tool as well? Yeah, and I I think that they what they're also finding aside from a training tool is it is you're using a lot of the similar reflexes right your intensity is different but you know you're you're actually your center of gravity and how you're positioning your body positioning on the bike um through obstacles whether it is you know fast descents whether it is jump a jump line or even climbing it's pretty similar yeah and luke you mentioned e- e-bikes like honestly like the first experience on an e-mountain bike that i ever had i couldn't remember i can't recall how loud i was laughing like a little kid in how it felt climbing because you could shift into a boost mode and it was almost like you were applying the throttle with how hard you were um, spinning your legs, climbing up stuff. And it felt like, it felt like it was, you know, you're riding a, a dirt bike yeah. to an extent, right? Yeah, so it was sure. really cool. Yeah, it is. Hey, speaking of uh, e-bikes, uh, I want to talk about our friends really quickly at Michelin Bicycle. Everybody knows Randy Richardson. Everybody knows about the awesome motorcycle tires that they make, but um Man, you know, we're talking about bikes today, so so check out Michelin on Instagram, at Michelin Bicycle. Um, one of the most popular products that they make, a tire that most of our team uses, is the Michelin E-Wild tire. It just won us a national championship in the youth division. We wrapped that up early with Cooper Kneff. He's on a Michelin E-Wild. Uh, they also have the Michelin Wild AM2, uh, the Michelin Force AM2. So you've got a lot of different options. And, and for the BMX savvy folks, uh, the Michelin Pilot SX, the Michelin Pilot SX, SX Slick. I have uh, I have those on my bike. They're cool. awesome. And uh, the people at Michelin are great. The products at Michelin are great. Um, you can try it on your GT if you guys get one. Talk to me about e-bikes, uh, Mike. It's obviously something that I'm passionate about. I think it's the re- so the the reason we met or we've been introduced was from Nash. And Nash yep. told me a story about how he's really trying to mold and, and help his his kids learn how to talk to sponsors. And that was how you I uh, you guys are working together uh, on a project. And that's where your name came up. So they they ha- his daughter. Did you guys uh, t- help them out with an? It was an e bike, correct? Sure. So. Yeah, and before we're related back to Michelin, yeah, I happens to also be the tire sponsor of GT Factory Racing. So there's this another plug there. I for didn't that. even know that. That's that's yes. perfect. Very yes. cool. But, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. But um, to, to Nash, yeah, Nash, Nash and I met when I first um kind of got in, got out of motocross and started doing on a dare more off road racing, and he, we had some mutual friends. And the personality of that guy, it's not an act. No, um, like no. he is a genuine full of life 
genuine character, but he's so positive. Like it's no wonder he's a career counselor, right? Like he could, I could be flunking out of um, out of high school, and I'd be convinced I could be an astronaut. Yeah, which is how uh, <laughs> uplifting he is. But yeah. I've known him and his family for a bit, and I was really excited to see what was on the horizon uh, on how he was kind of taking that next step with the girls and kind of that development team of Blue Crew East. And um, he was like, man. I know now is not the time. I know pandemic. There's no bikes out there. Um, but if the time comes and there's any chance to just try out um, at one of the GTE products, let me know. And of course, the samples that we had gotten in on our newer full suspension stuff, we were able to seed a handful. And then everything else, like the rest of the industry, is still waiting on other uh, components to be delivered, and, and they're they're delayed. But we did have a sample, a, show, a photo shoot sample from a year or two back of a hardtail one, a real fun, more of a more of a recreational entry level um, e bike, but something that Kate uh, can go out and pre ride the courses with, can get around the massive pits at GNCC. Um, and she was, you know, she was renting. Um, bikes just to pre-ride the courses prior. So she was working a part-time job just to do that. And I was like, Gosh, <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. Like, l- let me, let's see if I can help you out. I mean, this thing, this, this is the perfect home for it. And we've got plans for next year um, on that side to support them a bit more and try to support um, some other key riders in GNCC and in that motorsports crossover space as yeah. well. That, that's an interesting space to me, just obviously, cause I'm a fan of both and it's cool to see yep. two worlds coming together now. Um, and obviously I run an e-bike team and I'm seeing pure cyclists come into the sport of moto and I'm seeing pure moto fan or moto athletes, uh, and even quad racers try mm-hmm. their hand at, at cycling. So it's, it, it's really cool. And then now I'm seeing, you know, there's a couple of brands that are really getting involved in not just GNCC, but, but moto. So it tells me that, you know, brands like GT and others out there that have really good products, you guys are, you see a, you, you see an opportunity here and it's, and it right. clearly is a little bit different than a traditional analog or acoustic or whatever you want to call it, an old school <laughs> mountain sure. bike. Um, what, in what's your opinion of that? Why is, uh, why is there such potential for e-bikes specifically in the moto whether it's gncc or motocross in those communities it's i there's a few things there i think honestly the boost of power on a product that you can have control over i think it, there's something there right anybody like if you can ride a bike anybody can ride a bike but not everybody can knows how to control power and there's something in the psyche of a, of you know a, a, a moto head and an e-bike rider that it's like, oh, okay, I know that I can apply the throttle in certain ways. Um, the aesthetic of it, right? It looks a little bit more, um, although other brands are getting, like they are getting much more refined and sleeker and more integrated. There is kind of that appeal of like, kind of that that brawn and that muscle of an e-bike, which I think is similar in aesthetic to how um, motocross bikes are stylized. Yeah. And there's the fact of just like um, whether it is off-road racing or, or supercross, we'll say off-road, for example, for GNCC, there's that implied extended range, you know, like they, they're running bigger tanks, they're out there for a longer time. And, and on an e-bike, you know, you manage your power correctly, you can go out and go farther and have more fun for longer than you would on a, you know, a traditional mountain bike. And I think that's an appeal too. Yeah, for sure. Do you, so obviously with Nash and, and, and his daughter Kate and, and their team, um, you know, e-bikes are, man, it's, it's incredible how there's thousands of e-bikes in the GNCC community. Now, right now it's dominated by pretty much one brand. It's everywhere you yeah. look, there's this brand outside, uh, Folks like GT that aren't necessarily super involved in the GNCC community, ha- has that piqued your guys' interest to try to do more with, and even if it's not GNCC, maybe the local spinoff XC mm-hmm. motorcycle racing, do you guys see value in trying to be part of it? Because the brand that's there, it's a great bike. It's not the only great bike that's out there. There's several, um, and but I feel like there's real opportunity for iconic uh, legacy brands like GT to be part of that. What does that look like for you guys? Yeah, twofold. I think I think what that other brand is uh, is doing is awesome. You know, the fact that um, they saw an opportunity early and capitalized. Like, kudos to them for that for sure. Um, but just like there's multiple, just like there's Yamaha, and Kawasaki, and Honda, mm-hmm. uh, everybody, and all the Austrian brands out there racing. 
Um, I think I think there's definitely room for other players to come in and just be seen. Our approach definitely is um, with who we select as ambassadors. We try to actually build instead of flooding the market. We try to be a little bit more selective. Yeah. Um, some of that's due to budget. Some of that's due to just the, the ability to manage it, right? If you're actually making from a brand, you're making that donation to provide someone with free product or discounted product, you want to make sure there's return on investment, right? Sure. So you have to have people tracking it, making sure that they're they're out there, your ambassador or your sponsored rider or racers out there singing your praises. Yeah. So that's, a, that's not that easy to manage, believe it or not. <laughs> it's not like you go and you count hashtags. You really got to stay on top of that. So we're pretty selective with regional series. Um, yeah, there's... we. Our, our goal, especially with like Blue Crease and what Nash is doing is having them kind of jumping around at select series is like the perfect scenario. We've got, um, Luke, we've got ambassadors, like we sponsor the SGB Racing Supercross and Motocross team, yep. um, which is awesome. So they're kind of more of our flagship pro riders. We, Ronnie's been an ambassador for, for a, a long time as well, but we're also supporting um, what Jason Baker and the Groms are doing there down at the sandbox yep. at a level because providing them a bike that can be seen at these key regional events. And then as far as the apex event being Loretta Lynn's, I think is super important for us, or I know it is. And then on the GNCC side, when we just start to do more, I think it's good to have them in select for us. It's yeah. better to have us in select markets than just going, putting all our cards in and all our investment in one major series yeah are you going to be at loretta's this year by chance i, I wish i was yeah. i wish i was you going down there yeah so they have it's funny we we're kind of like the we get weird looks when we roll in we actually race the gncc series has an e-bike specific race it's a, it's an yep. fim north american championship and they do it on the saturday uh before i think practice for the the motocross amateur national starts on sunday or monday uh, something yeah. like that, and we we do it on Saturday. Um, so I was going to say, if you're going to be down there, we should we should link up. It's a really cool event. It's the only time I've ever been to Loretta's, and it's to race my e bike. <laughs> That's so, awesome. And I, we have we have lots of clients in the space, so I'm trying to make a more of a business trip out of it this year. And, and uh, last year we weren't really able to do that because you couldn't really meet and walk through the pits and stuff like that. But um, the Loretta's is it, it, that's interesting to me because you're mixing the biggest amateur motocross national in the world uh with now e-bike racing and i remember when we pulled in last year like literally even the gate staff were kind of like wait you're here for what they didn't even know why we were there and i'm like oh god this this is going to be a joke of an event like it, the staff doesn't even know why we're here and man it turned out there were hundreds of people that came from the motocross track walked across the street to watch our race it poured cool. the rain down there was a massive crowd um some of the motocross athletes actually got involved some gncc guys that can't normally race because they have their event the next day they came down and got involved it was, it was really cool and it's cool to see those two sports um kind of coming together and and yeah. being more of one than than two separate sports now it's really neat Yep. It's it, it's definitely in the cards. Last year there was conversations around um having some pri some surprise appearances with some uh, ambassadors to go out and race. This year with kind of everything starting to kind of resume to normal, there were some other kind of major initiatives um that we had to kind of bring to life that kind of, that did conflict yeah. around that that exact same time of year so unfortunately we couldn't be down there, but we'll we'll yeah. be there. Yeah, it's man it's it's been interesting to see what I <laughs> I still find it strange. It's strange for me as a cyclist to see brands like Husqvarna, um, yeah. Yamaha, all the, like motor motorcycle brands coming into the cycling space. I know KTM technically has made bicycles and they're a separate company. And so there's that, but, um, at the last GNCC at snowshoe, um, that series, just because of the sponsorship that, that specialized has there generally every bike on the the podium was pretty much dominated by one brand because they they're there. And it was the first time ever that one of the podiums, there was no specialized on. It was a high bike. It was a, uh, it was a Yamaha and it was a Husky. <laughs> and huh. it was so strange for me to see that it, none of them in my, like when I think of bicycles, I don't think a high bike. I don't think a Husky. I don't think of Yamaha, no offense to them, but I, I think of brands like GT, like specialized, like Haro brands that like Cannondale brands that have, that are iconic cycling brands as somebody that has worked for an iconic cycling brand for years. What is, 
your opinion, uh, if you don't mind sharing, do you find it weird that you, you see a lot of these moto specific brands starting to make e-bikes? Is it kind of like, okay, now you're coming into our space. We're going to, it pushes you to continue to be better. Do you think it's a good thing? What, what's, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? No, it's honestly, it's, that's a really good question too, because it's I, weird. It, yeah. I mean, it may be weird just because, you know, the gas, gas place, they'll say gas, gas, and it's an e-bike and you can't put gas, <laughs> gas yeah, that's funny. anywhere on it yeah. um, or in it. But um, other than that, no, it, they saw an opportunity, right? Sure. So it's, you can't fault them for that. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's on the bicycle brands um, to try to make sure that you level the playing field and, and, I think competition always brings out the best in brands and some, sure. some will succeed, some won't. So it's, it is quite interesting, Luke, to, to see. Yeah. I've got a friend from, uh, from a for, former, uh, colleague that's actually working, um, on the European side of the, the Husqvarna e-bike business. Yeah. And I like spent time in Europe. I've seen those bikes in person. They're super cool. And what the KTM bicycle line, although it's a different entity, the licensing and kind of the brand standards that they're held to the, the consistency is really, really strong across the the moto side of things yeah yeah no doubt mike as we kind of wrap up i want to talk to you about the power and and popularity of e-commerce right now and before we do uh i want to talk a little bit about uh my company uh impact Mm -hmm. results online shopping everybody knows it's at an all-time high impact helps moto brands cycling brands um execute marketing strategies to drive trackable online uh results social media advertising, search engine advertising, SEO, web design, email marketing, etc. We do this with brands like Seven, FMF, Lucas Oil Pro Motocross. Um, and right now I'm offering a free strategy, uh, essentially a strategy call. And you'll meet with myself or one of the executives here. Um, if that's something you're interested in, it's pretty simple. Just go shoot me an email. It's luke at thinkimpact.com. It's T-H-I-N-K. I-M-P-A-K-T dot com. So that ad read reminded me, I need to ask you before we run out of time and we are running sure. out of time. Um, man, it, it, <laughs> bicycle sales is in a weird spot right now. Pretty much nobody can get what they need. Like I have to worry about, man, if I break a derailleur, um, <laughs> I might not have it in time for the next race. So uh, especially yeah. with e-bikes, there's a lot of stuff that breaks on these because they get put through a lot. Are you guys, so I guess the, the best way I can come up with this question is do you guys still rely on heavily the traditional dealership model or is it starting to or do you do you rely on direct to consumer because i know you know there's some brands that you go online you buy your bike it shows up at your door um what does that look like for gt so the uh the answer for that is well number one your derailleur comment that has been the the most (laughs) insane insane experience of my life with just the whole supply chain um backlog and there's there's like you saw with the suez canal i mean there's a container shortage right so there's bikes yeah. that are coming from the factory that are lined up waiting to get loaded into containers because there's so much stuff on the water coming over that there's delays there so it, it's nuts it's yeah. really nuts lead times are like quadrupled we um at, you know as a brand that has to market bicycles um, a lot of our retailers have pre-booked, right? They're sold through already. So we're actually helping, um, they've sold in already. We're helping sell through where it was more to raise awareness and, and more of a double-edged sort approach. Um, today we launched this really, check it out after this loop, um, this new range of bikes. Um, it's the, you remember the Pro Performer from back in the day, the, yeah. the legendary freestyle bike. This is yeah. a big version of that for commuting. Um, there's an urban analog version nine speed one with fenders and stuff like that. And then there's a power performer. So it's actually a, a big wheel BMX with, with a, with a, a motor. Wow. So you got to check that out. And it is, um, it's something that we've been trying to align on these key dates on when regional inventory would be available that we can flip the switch. So that's been the most insane kind of logistics and planning, uh, 20 months of my life, but it's also <laughs> fun. So when it comes to, distribution and kind of a channel strategy for GT. Um, our goal, uh, I think is what's really important for us is to be as easy for the, we'll say America, uh, the American consumer, but as easy to access as possible. Yeah. So we've actually specifically have great partners that are, um, online players like a, a, a backcountry or a level nine sports, something like that. Um, 
city grounds out west, Jensen, brand like kind of big shops like that. Yep. We've got some really great brick and mortars, um, but we've also got a whole line of bikes for those that are more intimidated by a bike shop, and they're in Dick Sporting Goods, and they're yeah. the same quality you can get. Um, uh, it's a different special line for Dick Sporting Goods, but it's just to be to lower that barrier of entry to get people hooked on the sport. Yeah, and it, it's been pretty cool with the pandemic to see um, more people get hooked on the sport for sure. Yeah, I, yeah for sure. It's it, it's it's incredible that pretty uh, most businesses are trying not to die, and you got cycling and moto, and like you're, you're trying to. Um, not die from being overworked because business is booming so much. But I, I think it's cool. I mean, it, look, I, I I remember when I was a kid, if I saw a bike in Dick's or in Walmart, you would knock on it. You're like, oh, it's a Walmart bike. And I feel like that's changed. And, and as, as, as you get older and you realize, like, look, it, it gives people – like, when you walk into a bike shop and you see – name the brand and it's a – I mean, man, there's some e-bikes right now that are fifteen or $13,000. Like, you're not going to get somebody – into the sport on that but maybe he or she wants to go ride and they're less intimidated to go to dicks and they can get a quality product it's not a right. it's not a next <laughs> it's right. like that was what i thought of when i was a kid was off oh, it's next to them it's it's probably not good but it, it, it's changed and what's cool is i have physically seen it myself to where somebody gets a an entry level bike and now they have this emotional connection with a brand like gt and maybe they get an even better uh product but they stay with that brand and you guys can graduate them up uh as far as you know entry level to mid level to high end um it's yeah it, it cycling can be very snobbish if if you're not it, same thing with skiing like skiing today sure. i think is skiing is going to be in a world of hurt in the next five years because i can i can literally go to disney world cheaper than what i can take a family skiing now and it's like how do you expect to get people into the sport and i think people have to step back and look at brands like gt that are trying to find ways of getting people into the sport that yep. are afraid to shell out tons and, and tons of money um so i think that's really cool that you guys do that yeah we're one of, we're look we're one of the few brands that people can actually grow with yeah you know from from like kids push bikes to through bmx either yeah. freestyle or race and then it's if you want to go gravel biking, you want to get in the drop bar or the gravel scene. If you want to go mountain, you want to go E, you want to go full downhill, yeah. dirt jump. Not a lot of brands actually have that no. variety. So, yeah, that's, sure. that's kind of where as far as strategy and, and vision moving forward, that's you, you hit the nail on the head. Make it easy, make it accessible and kind of increase that affinity, not just brand awareness, but make make someone feel like they're they can kind of connect with GT. No doubt. Hey, where are you located at? Are you near uh, are you in, on the East Coast? Yeah, so East Coast. So we're actually um, the corporate headquarters of CSG Global is in Norwalk slash Wilton, Connecticut, which okay. is about a, an hour away from the city on the Connecticut side. And I'm, I live in New York State, so I'm about an hour drive inland from Connecticut. Well, so for those listening, this is the first time Mike and I have actually spoke and seen each other be, beyond an email. Uh, yeah. And man, I, I hope obviously I'm gonna we're gonna hop off here, and I'd like to schedule a time with you next week to just chat. Sure. But man, I'm hoping I'm hoping we get a ride one day. I, if I'm friends yeah. with Nash, and I've told Nash, I'm like, look, we gotta we gotta link up, we gotta ride. I'll come up that way, whatever. Hopefully, we can uh, we can make that happen. I'll coordinate with you, and maybe we'll be at the same event one of these days. That'll be really cool. Hey, I really like. Where can people find more information about all the products that you guys offer from BMX to regular mountain bikes to e-bikes? Sure. Uh, GTBicycles.com. That's an easy one. And then uh, uh, definitely on our Instagram or any of our social media is just at GTBicycles. Awesome. Awesome. Man, I, I seriously, I've enjoyed this conversation. Anytime I get to talk to somebody that's into moto and cycling, it's a it's a treat. Um, that's what's fun about this podcast is meeting cool people like you. And, man, I really appreciate you coming on. I really appreciate you having me. Yeah, let's let's uh let's continue the conversation. I do hope we could ride uh we could ride soon. I think that'd no be doubt. awesome. No doubt. Hey Mike, I appreciate it. Uh Mike Morrow with uh GT Bicycles. Thanks for joining us today. You got it. All I'll right. talk to you guys soon. Thank you for listening to the Moto Marketing Podcast. If your goal is to get real, measurable results from your marketing that will grow your company revenue, then check out how Impact Media can get the same results that they have for Moto's most iconic brands by visiting thinkimpact.com. That's T-H-I-N-K-I-M-P-A-K-T.com. Have a marketing question that you want answered on the show? Send your questions to questions at motomarketingpodcast.com. Don't 
forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. And we'll catch you on the next episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast.